live i think we i think we are i think we are so we're at 11 o'clock um thanks to everybody for joining us for this last session of our 2020 virtual track camp we've really enjoyed it and uh have appreciated the attendees and the panelists and our athletes who have joined us and our our special guests who have uh zoomed in to be a part of this with us and we we've uh We've had a great week, and um, we just finished a nice workout with, with Daniel Romanchuk in, uh, in the roller room, um, and he will be joining us soon as well. Um, but uh, this last session, what we're going to do is uh, have a roundtable with some of our Paralympic athletes uh, from, the, from the University of Illinois wheelchair track program, and I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to go through just a quick bio on each of them um, because I know they don't like talking about themselves. So I will do that. I'll do that for them. And then, then we'll, we'll start asking questions. And then as we progress through, we have some questions that I'm going to ask them, but questions that you have the attendees, please put that in the Q and a section and then I will moderate and, and ask those uh, for you. So um, again, thanks. I'm really looking forward to this. It'll, it'll be a lot of fun. Um, so today, joining us, let me get my slide show going here. We have a round table with US Paralympians and a uh, few of the featured athletes on. One is uh, Chelsea McClamor, and um, I'm not going to read through all of her performances, but she's multi multi-time Paralympian, multi-time medalist, uh, Paralympic Games and the World Championships, um, has a uh, world record hole in the 5,000 and uh, had a very, very successful career, which will continue um, as, as we move into to 2021. Um, also joined by Kelsey Lefever. Uh Kelsey was on 2016 team and, and uh, has also been a Parapan team member, um, world championships uh, as well. And, and, uh, and Kelsey is, a, is keyed and tuned in on the, the sprints. She really likes the 100 and really likes 200. Um, and uh, I think the 400, we can ask her that later. I think I asked, posed that question to her. Uh, Tatiana will be joining us at some point. Um, uh, she had to, uh, she'll be jumping on here in a little bit. Um, Tatiana's five-time Paralympian. Um, she won 17 medals and, and had a very 
very good run of success that, that will continue in the Paralympic Games um, and World Championship. Um, interesting, she was uh, she won six world titles um, at one world championships. That was a really good week and a half for um, Dana Romchuk, who is just working out. He'll be joining us too. Um, Daniel's uh, young in the game. He's uh, he made the Paralympic team in 2016. Um, he's good, good experience, cut his teeth, and, and has over the last couple of years really moved into his own and and uh, and commanded. Um, uh, that T54 division, um, current world record holder, um, and uh, the mentioned this morning, the only the only person in the wheelchair to ever break 90 seconds in, a, in an 800. Um, so um, really has been very successful. Um, Aaron Pike uh, will be joining us too. He was our featured athlete on Monday for those of you who worked out with with us. Um, Aaron's two-time Paralympian in track. He's also Paralympian in, in winter sport uh, Nordic. Um, and, uh, and also world championships has had some really great, great races. Um, and, uh, and two, much like the other athletes, uh, Aaron's Rita had a great season on the road last year. Not that the other is, his previous seasons were, were as well, but we see this continual linear climb and his, his performance and ability. Um, Brent Seaman is also joining us, two-time Paralympian, who's won the London and Rio team. Um, so world, world championships. And um, um, has had some, some really uh, great performances, and and um, and was was just narrowly um, off the podium in 2019. We're, we're, he's going to get there in 2021, um, and um, so we're, we're fortunate to have Brian um, joining us. And and that's it. So I've run to let me let me get out of there, and then I'm going to come here and stop my screen share. Um, can you guys, some of the panelists like nod at me. You can see me and not my screen, right? Yeah. Okay, great. We're All right, I just want to make sure you got me. All right, super duper. Okay, well, let's uh, let's get things rolling. So you've met the athletes, quick buy about each of them. So this question is for each of you, and we can go from, we'll go Kelsey, to Susanna, to Chelsea, to Aaron, Brian, Daniel, in that order for this first one, okay? Um, question is, what's your favorite event to compete in? And it can be the track, it can be the road. And then just tell me why that is. Tell me why that is. So um, so go ahead. It looks like Chelsea's up first. I don't know, you're on the video, so go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, I like the 5,000. I think that would be my favorite. Um, every year that we go to Switzerland and we try to qualify, like get the time um, to get the standard to be on the national team. Um, all the other countries are, they're usually pretty cool about um, wanting to get the fastest time possible. And so everybody kind of works together and it's a fun race. Um, it's not fun getting dropped in it, but <laughs> I guess it's a long race to finish all alone. Um, but I, I don't, just think it's fun to work together with everybody and with my Illinois and USA teammates. <laughs> so that's my favorite. Nice. Okay. Uh, now it's Kelsey. Are you ready? Yeah. Hi everyone. Good morning. Um, so very opposite to the 5,000. My favorite event to compete in on the track is the hundred. Um, I really liked um, kind of honing in on uh, start tactics and, and kind of refining that skill, um, which is super important in the hundreds. Um, and it's over really, really fast. And um, so um, quite opposite and quite um, opposite in that you're not necessarily racing in a pack or anything like that. So it's super um, kind of individual and kind of focusing in on uh, skills that you've worked on. Um, through, well, any races that way too, but um, skills that you've worked on kind of prepping for that season as well as building on from kind of seasons before. So. Great, okay, uh, Susanna. Um, hey guys, I would say, honestly, I think my favorite race might honestly be the 10K. I think that it's long enough that you have to have some endurance, but it's also short enough that you get to go a pretty high like percentage of your max the whole time. So 
um, I kind of like doing that in general. So that's my favorite race, I think. Very nice. Um, okay, Tatiana has joined us. So Tatiana, question is, what's your favorite event to compete in, track or road, and then and then why? All right, you're on mute though. You gotta unmute yourself. My favorite event is definitely the sprinting. I love the four and I love the 800. I didn't start road racing until 2009, but it's also become one of my favorites as well. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, Aaron. I would definitely have to say the marathon. Um, <laughs> I like the longer race, I like the, uh, how dynamic it is, how there's lots, a lot going on. Every year it can be a little different with the weather. You got climbs, downhills, lots of turning, pack racing, surges. Yeah, definitely the marathon. Nice, nice. Um, Brian. Uh, my favorite event is going to be uh, the marathon. No, um, it is the 800. <laughs> Uh, I I like the 800 because it is a combination of it's it's a sprint, but you you get to to do a little bit of distance as well. Um, there's some tactics involved. You have to get off the line fast, but then um, just when your body is in a lot of pain and misery, you then still have one more lap to go. So um, so I really like that one. Nice. Um, and let's see, is Daniel on yet? Not yet. That's okay. He was just trying to finish up with his, his workout. So uh, we'll get him on here in a second. Okay, that's great. So the next question, um, this is for Brian and Tatiana. Brian, you go first. Tatiana, you go second. So the um, question is, do you get nervous before you race? And if you do, how do you handle pre-competition nerves? What do you do? What are, your, what are some tips and thoughts? Because you've both been very successful. So somehow you're managing it if you do get nervous. Go ahead, Brian. Um, so for me, everyone, so just in case a lot of people don't know. So um, when I was younger, I used to get very nervous before I would race. Um, I wouldn't be able to eat anything. Um, and I would be so nervous that it would be difficult to talk to me because I would be um, – very quiet and just sort of shaking and I would have this like pit in my stomach because I thought I was going to throw up. Um, and this would be hours before, before competition, let alone, um, once you actually like get to the track and things like that. And so, um, I tried to work on that years ago, trying to, um, to improve that because it's really important that you, um, are able to manage sort of your nerves and everything before you race, because, um, it can play a big role in, in your actual performance. And so, um, what I like to do is, um, I like to, uh, one, I, I put the race into perspective as it's just another race. Um, so whether it's the final, the 800 final at the Paralympic games, or whether it is just a local regional track meet, um, it's just a race. And um, I, I have learned to um, kind of disassociate sort of the caliber of competition and things like that and just really focus on um, the training that I've done to get up to that point. And so when I start to feel nervous or anxious about what I am trying to do um, right before the track meet, um, I tend to think about the good practices I've had. Um, and so the, the days when I've been training and, you know, I've, I've managed to do something that, uh, you know, kind of exceeded my expectations or where I felt really good. And just remember that those sort of experiences helped get me to um, that meet that I'm at now. And so I'm um, focusing on the positive, um, knowing that I've put in the training to get to that point and that I'm as prepared as I possibly can be, um, all sort of helped me mentally focus and not really focus on the anxiety and nerves about what I'm doing, but rather um, know that I'm, I'm as prepared as I possibly can be. That's great. That's great. Very good. Very good. All right, Tatiana, um, same question. Do you get nervous before a race? And if you do, how do you, how do you handle that? Absolutely. Uh, maybe harass Adam a little bit. <laughs> just, yeah, just kidding. <laughs> um, 
but for me, what's really helped is that I think seeing like a sports psychologist and kind of going um, through a mental game plan has really been really successful for me. Um, and getting into a really healthy routine and practicing that um, for, especially leading up to a race, making sure I'm sleeping well, hydrating well, eating well. Um, and it's just, you know, a little bit similar to Brian as well, but also learning from past races and, um, you know, what went well and what I could improve on and what, you know, what might have happened during the race um, and trying to fix that for, for the next one, but just really just enjoying it as well. And um, each race that I get to do, I'm really happy that I get to do it because um, you never know what life plans or health could get in the way. So I really um, am always thankful to be on a starting line to every race and just, you know, um, just going for it and just letting the training lead um, the, the race and just um, preparing for anything that might happen in the race and the tactics and just loving it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, very, very good. I think you touched on some, both of you had some, some consistent themes there and touched on, on some of the same points. So it's really, really great. Um, let's see. Um, okay, so we're going to move. I think Daniel's just about getting on. He, he was having some issues. Oh, he's on. Yes, Daniel, I am. You hear me? Okay, great, great, great. Just in time. That was perfect timing. Perfect timing. Um, so the next question, Daniel, is going to be for you and for Kelsey. I'm going to let Kelsey go first just so you can get your bearings, and then uh, I'll have you answer the same question. And uh, this is, who, who's your favorite athlete to compete against? So we, we all have um, our, our uh, friends and, and competitors that we really enjoy and thrive competing against. So, um, so talk a little bit about it. Who's your favorite athlete to compete against, and, and then why is that the case? So Kelsey, you're first, and then Daniel, you're second. Um, so I think uh, right now, um, well, as always, I've always really loved being able to um, race and um, compete with um, my own teammates and people that you kind of train with um, every day and um, kind of the whole kind of process of going to competitions and kind of doing that as sort of a team um, I've always really enjoyed. Um, in kind of my race, specifically in the 100, um, these days I've really enjoyed competing against, um, her name's Jessica Lewis from Bermuda. Um, and we both kind of got involved um, in racing probably within a couple years of each other. Um, I was maybe a couple years before her, but um, so kind of being able to, to grow up in the sport, I guess, so to speak, um, has been really fun. And um, because we don't train together, or, um, get to see each other uh, very often, it's always uh, super fun um, kind of at competitions and, and um, kind of being on the track uh, together and um, she's uh, pretty fast so it's uh, fun to great to yeah sweet so just to do this all right all right cool um, how about you Daniel yeah Aaron's flexing <laughs> So Daniel, who's your favorite Sorry, athlete to compete against? Myself. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, and I, I know there are there may, may be certain people on this call that will say that there is a certainly a right and wrong <laughs> answer. Uh, right. I've never really given it too much thought. Um, yes, Daniel, there is. <laughs> I just I you know I I enjoy the sport. Uh, you know, no matter who I'm pushing with, uh, you know. It's uh, it, it's always interesting to see just the the different uh, everyone interacting uh, and in all the different courses. Uh, you you never know quite what's going to happen uh, next, and so I wouldn't say that I have a, a specific person that I uh, you know is my favorite person to push with. Uh, but I just I enjoy pushing with uh, you know ev everyone that uh you know is, is uh pushing on that day but mostly me all right i was about to no, say no, sorry no, for no, those no. of you who may be uh, not expecting that answer <laughs> all right thanks daniel 
Okay, next question is going to be for Aaron and then Susanna. Um, and let's just talk a little bit about your the process for you to make your first national team. Uh, if you remember that, I uh, hope you've had a little time to think about when that was. But um, and just thinking about so from when you started and, and, and moved into the sport, how long did it take you to qualify for your first national team? Um, but not just national team, but one competing at the Paralympic Games. So really the question is, how long did it take you to qualify for your first Paralympic Games? And this is um, uh, just the amount of training that, that it took, and, and, um, and that's, that's the idea of the question. So uh, Aaron, you're first, then uh, Susanna. Yeah, I think definitely took – it took a little while, I guess. Um, I, I didn't come to Illinois until 2007, the spring of 2007. And before then, I wasn't, wasn't really doing any kind of um, structured training at all. Um, not too much in the racing chair. I was playing, playing basketball, and I was riding a hand suck, and I was doing a little bit of racing chair stuff, but there wasn't, wasn't much going on when I was um, – um, moving around. I was in, my dad was in the Air Force, so I was kind of moving around quite a bit. So it wasn't like a, uh, wasn't locked into a um, youth program or anything like that. So uh, it didn't really kick off really until I like went to Illinois and I got out of my chair that was 10 inches too wide and jumped into the old Conan chair. And then uh, okay. from there, I think I got my first chair um, probably like six months or so before the first like trial Beijing came up really fast after I um, went out to Illinois and that was my first Paralympic trials in Arizona I think and I think Adam no I think I was like one or two spots off maybe um, for for that mm -hmm. games it was really close and um, mm -hmm. at the time I was pretty upset but looking back I mean I was like at barely <laughs> barely started so um, so then, so then from there, yeah, I had like a solid four more years at U of I, um, before 2012. And the last year was super focused because I was out of school and had stopped playing basketball and, uh, was just really focusing on the track and the road. Um, and then I was able to qualify for my first, um, make the team for London, um, which is pretty sweet. And I was super excited about, so it took, I mean, yeah, it took a long time for me, I guess, to make my first first games. Great, great. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron. All right, uh, Susanna. Okay. There. Are you muted, Susanna? Um, yeah, now I'm back. Um, I would say, like Aaron, it took me quite a while. Um, and, like, I started off in a really strong juniors program, like, in fifth grade. And so I, and I loved it. So like, um, you know, a good coach, I worked really hard, um, but it still took me 11 years um, of doing wheelchair racing to like make my first national team, which was also happened to be the 2012 Paralympics. Um, and I would say like, it took a lot of front work, like learning the technique as a kid. Um, but then when I came to Illinois in 2011, it was, understanding how to be more efficient um, and to be like, think about wheelchair racing and the specifics more so than just um, training really hard, like I like to do. So it took me a long time and I'm still continuing to learn and get better. Yeah. Yeah, great, great. That's, uh, um, well, I think the commonality is that it takes a little bit of time to, to um, <laughs> Of, of to aggregate quality volume to to um, be at the level where you expect to make a parallel team and then podium and and and, and, um, and so on. So um, very good. Thank you both for that. Uh, next question. This is for Kelsey and then Brian. Um, the question is, what's the most challenging part of the sport for you? What's the most challenging part of wheelchair racing uh, for you? And Kelsey, you're first. So I think um, for me, it's always been sort of the uh, mental component of it. Um, I mean, the physical stuff, obviously, and learning the technique and kind of getting in in the right seating position. But um, so when I started racing, I actually was a freshman in college. So um, Adam has been my one and only coach ever. Um, and I 
kind of came into this program where there was a lot of really high caliber athletes that had a lot more experience than me. Um, and I was kind of starting from like day one um, and kind of in that environment. Um, and so that kind of com mental component of realizing like how much you have to learn and how, uh, well, also kind of like seeing the bar every day because I was, you know, around all of these athletes that were super high performing. Um, and I'm over here just trying to like, you know, learn the lines of the track and stay in my lane and all of these um, things. And, and it was a struggle, um, I think, early, but I was, you know, very fortunate that kind of the environment that you find yourself in, that it was always really supportive. And um, I, you know, became friends with people on the team really early, which um, I think helped create sort of this community of like wanting to keep coming back um, because it was so supportive and everybody was so um, encouraging, but um, it was certainly a, a hurdle that um, I've sort of experienced um, in various ways throughout um, my career. And um, so I think though it's been kind of the challenging aspect of it, the result of it um, and kind of the support system that comes from sort of being in um, an environment that, um, has people that want to see people get better in the sport um, certainly helps um, mediate that quite a bit. Um, and I'm uh, very grateful for that. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Kelsey. All right, Brian, what's the most challenging part of wheelchair racing for you? Um, so the most challenging part of wheelchair racing for me, um, so um, probably is maintaining that sort of commitment to like, healthy eating and um, staying on top of like my diet and things like that. Um, for those of you that I don't know who's actually in this thing or not, but like I really love junk food, like really love eating like ice cream and Taco Bell and all the food you're not supposed to eat as a wheelchair racer. Um, if you want to. Um, Donuts. Okay. This isn't like dump on Brian and all the food he likes to eat. Um, so Reese's. yeah. I, Okay. Oh my God. I bring Reese's with me to races. Um, so I really like Reese's eating Reese's. all. Okay. <laughs> we get it. I like good food. Um, so I like, so for me, when I was younger, um, when I had got to Illinois, um, and I really wanted to commit to making my first Paralympic team, um, I had a conversation with Adam about, sort of the steps that I needed to take. And one of those steps was to really take my nutrition seriously. Um, and so um, that it ha was and still is sort of this um, daily kind of uh, effort on my part to um, make like good conscientious choices about what I'm putting into my body. Because a lot of times um, when I was younger, I would tell myself, well, I'm pushing, you know, so many miles a day, I'm working out every day, I can eat what I'd like. Um, and the reality of the situation is, is that you could theoretically do that, but your body needs, you know, good food and healthy food. And I'm sure you probably talked about that in your nutrition talk. It needs good quality foods for you to continue to perform well. And so for me, that's always been a challenge is that like, I see the donuts and I see the ice cream and, and all the other like food that I love. And it's making that choice that um, to, to not necessarily eat that all the time. I still maintain that everything in moderation is good, um, but to make good, healthy choices pretty much every day of the week, um, and then maybe only have like one cheat day every couple weeks. So. Very good, thank you both. Yeah, thank you both, great answers. Um, all right, next question, speaking of eating, this is for Daniel first and then Tatiana second. And that is, what's your favorite pre-competition meal? So Daniel, you answer that first and then Tatiana, you're second. Ooh, um, favorite, that, that qualifier right there. I really don't like it. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I always uh, bring with me uh, you know, I use, have in the past, uh, actually, just brought uh, tortillas and peanut butter and jelly. It's something that, you know, I know how it affects my body. Uh, and so it's a, a consistent thing that I can have uh, before a race. As in, 
I know my internet's unstable. Is, is it still? Am I still connected? Good. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that I had always brought to races. I know, um, you know, I know how it uh, affected me, and uh, so it was something that was consistent. Um, but uh, now um, I'm actually a, a Cliff Bar athlete, and so I've been starting to use just a lot of uh, a lot of their products. And so, uh, you know, that's now on uh, on my list every uh, every race morning. I uh, bring a Cliff Bar to the start line. Okay. Uh, Tatiana. For me, if it's the night before, I usually like to eat really bland, whether if it's rice or gluten-free pasta, plain chicken or plain um, steak or, or fish, but keep it relatively um, bland. It's just easier on my stomach for the next morning when you're pretty nervous. And the morning of the race, I just eat um, gluten-free oatmeal. Um, and if I have time, I'll eat a little bit of protein with it right before. Um, but I do like to sleep in relatively close before getting downstairs. So it's really just a uh, gluten-free um, oatmeal and, and some water. Great, great, super, super. <clears throat> okay, uh, next question. Chelsea, you're gonna go first, and then Aaron, you're second. And so the question is, what's your favorite workout? I and mean, you have a lot to choose from, but, um, Give me, give me one of your more favorite workouts. Chelsea, you're up first. Okay. Um, my favorite workout is rolling 400s. And so, <laughs> and I feel like this is a, a lot of our teammates' favorite workout. Um, so Adam calls it our bread and butter workout because um, it touches on a lot of things. So the point of the workout is to start 500 meters before the finish. and um, you want to, it's like rolling. So you're already moving and you want to get up to your top speed within that first hundred meters. So by the time you cross that mark, you're at your top speed and then you want to hold it the entire way. Um, so sometimes we try to like increase it in the last hundred meters um, just to see how fast we can go. And I like it because I can, as the season goes on, we'll do it like every other week um, and I can see if I'm improving um, and also where I need to improve. So if I'm getting dropped by the group that I should be in, that means I am um, not accelerating fast enough and so I know that I need to work on my excels. Or if I'm just not even close to them, that means I know I need to work on my strength and I need to work on my top speed. And then if I'm getting dropped by the end, that means I know I need to work on my kick. So, and it's just a fun workout and it's also only like 400 meters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good workout. I like that one too. Uh, okay, Aaron, what about you, man? I'd have to say the, for the track, um, probably, probably one of the ladders. I like the ladder, the 200, 200, um, two, two, four, four, six, six, eight, eight thousand, thousand. Um, it's, yeah, it usually ends up being a pretty challenging day. Um, you get to work on sticking tight in a pack. And a lot of times if we're, if we don't have a bike out in front of us, then we're kind of rotating. So you're constantly rotating throughout the draft and taking, um, taking turn pulling and just the speed variation. I think, um, I like a lot during that one. And then, just kind of trying to the challenge of like <laughs> it's pretty windy in Illinois, so we have a constant um, variation in what 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 section of the track is the challenging side, and trying to keep um, very even pacing throughout that entire workout. Um, yeah, I definitely think that's one of the one. And then on the road, it's just like the night. I always look forward to Saturdays when we have um, long longer twenty milers, and it's just a just a fart like session where you have no idea what's going to happen on that particular day. <laughs> especially with Daniel, Daniel and a bunch mm -hmm. of bikes out there. You never know what kind of paces you're going to be pushing, but um, yeah, it's a good way to close out the week too. I think just a good, hard, long um, Saturday push. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I like those two. Those are, those are a good way to button up the end of the week. Um, super. But yeah. Thanks for, thanks for both of you for that one. Okay. This one, uh, this is for uh, 
uh, Susanna first and then Kelsey second. And that is this is, have you ever had an injury? Um, and, and I know you both have, <laughs> but so how did you work through it and return to racing? So I know there's been some, multiple episodes that you've worked through, but just pick one, pick one and, and talk a little about, about what happened and, and uh, your mental state and what you physically did to get back on target. So uh, Susanna, you're up first. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, I've had several, um, but I think one of the ones that comes to mind the most is when I first arrived um, with U of I, I had been a vegetarian for a few years at that point. Um, and we were, it was like February, uh, it was like kind of like getting into like used to being on rollers and having hard roller sessions. Um, and like all of a sudden we were doing like some 30 second sprints, uh, repeats of that. And I just felt like I cracked my rib or something like I've had the worst pain in my ribs that I've ever experienced. Um, and like the whole rest of the day, I felt like there was an elephant sitting on my stomach and it just got worse and worse and worse. Um, Brian actually luckily like drove me around um, because it was like so hard to push my wheelchair. Um, and that like turned into, it was like kind of like a stress fracture just in like the intercostal muscles of my rib cage. Um, but it wasn't really the first time I'd had something along those lines. And what I did honestly was I um, chatted the next fall because I'd had a few more sort of weird kind of muscle injuries like that um, when things got intense. And I chatted with our sports dietitian, um, Dr. Liz Broad, and she really encouraged me to like consider my diet more um, and how much protein and quality protein I was getting um, to be able to recover from our really hard workouts that I wasn't used to. And it honestly I hadn't I didn't have a stress fracture um again after I started adding animal protein back in um it for just for me animal protein became like a more convenient way to get more protein um not it doesn't mean a vegetarian diet can't be healthy but I think by changing my diet a little bit based on the recurring injuries I was getting um that's helped me a lot to uh prevent stress fractures yeah. Great, know. great, great. Okay. Super duper. Um, all right, Kelsey. Um, have you had an injury and how'd you work through it and get, get uh, back in practice competition? Yeah, so I actually um, just am on the, the wake of a, an injury. I had an unexpected surgery um, at the start of this summer um, on my foot, which in and of itself um, doesn't really like affect wheelchair racing if you're um, you know, using your upper body, but um, I had had surgery, so I had um, stitches and kind of an, a wound that had to heal, um, so I couldn't get in my racing chair um, or do any sort of um, much upper body stuff until the stitches came out, um, and so I think some kind of factors that, um, like, so stuff like that can come up unexpectedly, and kind of as um, I think Brian was talking earlier with nutrition and kind of the lifestyle of training and, and kind of kind of being involved in, in sport and, and competition and things like that, um, that all of those other factors kind of come into sort of your preparedness um, as an athlete and kind of being sure that you're um, being as healthy as possible. And so um, thinking about that sort of as sort of that kind of unexpected uh, thing comes up um, really honed in, um, was one fortunate that that stuff was sort of all in place that, um, I didn't feel like I was going sort of into that sort of digging yourself out of a hole where you're, um, not necessarily, you know, have had a good diet or getting enough sleep or drinking enough water or focusing on recovery. Um, and so, um, I had surgery the end of May, um, and for three weeks I couldn't, you know, do anything at all. And so, um, really took kind of some of those practices of trying to be sure I was um, eating well and, and um, drinking enough water, getting enough sleep, um, and just sort of taking care of um, the body and kind of doing everything sort of around um, sort of what would be time in the racing chair um, to ensure that when I was able to get back in my racing chair, um, that I wasn't kind of even further behind than um, I would be kind of if I had sort of let some of those things lapse. 
Um, and then I wasn't immediately able uh, to get back in my racing chair and so uh, found kind of ways to still um, be. Um, I spent another two weeks on the UBE. Um, so kind of kept my, where I couldn't, still couldn't get my leg into my racing chair, but um, could be active on the UBE and um, getting back into strength training. Um, and um, again, focusing on kind of the things around um, the racing, like that it's not just the racing chair itself, but it's all of those other um, components of, of um, training and that they all kind of help work together um, to sort of create um, sort of you as sort of the most prepared you can be um, in training and competition. So um, it's certainly hard though. Um, it's hard when you know everybody else is training and you can't be. Um, and so I think that contributed to even more so wanting to be sure that I was focusing on some of those things that um, I still could do really well and, and had control over. Um, and then over the last two weeks, I've been able to get um, back in my racing chair. And um, I think, you know, anybody that's had to take time out of the racing chair, those like first few days back are um, tough because you're um, sort of out of, even just like out of the, the feeling of being like folded up in the racing chair um, and nothing about the like, you know, finding the hand ring again. And so um, it certainly uh, was challenging, but I think, you know, remembering to give yourself kind of grace in that period that, and trusting your training from before um, that, you know, you're going to be able to kind of bounce back into it and it's going to take time. And, um, but that, Super. Yeah, no that's good. I think that's a great, you make a great point. Yeah, about that. So you gotta you just have to be a little, you gotta be patient with yourself when you're easing back into the, the training cycle. So that's a, a good point mm -hmm. that you make. Okay, um, next question. This one's for Chelsea first and Tatiana second. And, and that is this is that um, are there days you wake up and you just don't feel like practicing? Hey, and uh, you just like, nah, today is going to be a day of drink coffee, read newspaper, and just maybe jump on, play some, some uh, Fortnite or something. Um, anyways, but you still got to go if you want to, if you want to uh, improve and, and, uh, and meet your goals, you got to, you got to, you got to, you need to get up and get motivated. So what do you do to get motivated? Okay, Chelsea, you're first, and Tatiana, you're second. Okay. Um, so I definitely do have days like that. And so barring any injuries, which is more of a legitimate reason to um, take a day off, um, if I just wake up and I'm just out of it and um, had a rough week, just don't want to go, um, I just, I think about the competitions that might be coming up and there, so there's a sign in our roller room that says, um, when I train hard, I win easy. <laughs> and so that's kind of a simplified version of um, my thought process. I'm just like, you know what, even if, you know, if we don't have a competition coming up, I'm like, I'm laying, I'm laying out the groundwork for even harder training and then for a competition, even though our next competition is, um, you know, potentially next year, um, I still think it's going to, it's obviously going to go a lot better if I'm training. Um, and it's also going to be more fun because it's never fun to get dropped or like have a bad start. Um, so I know that if I'm, I'm focused and I'm training at the time that I'm just going to have more fun at a competition. And that's, I mean, that's why we do this is because we enjoy it. So, yeah. Great point. Yeah. Good points. Okay. Tatiana. Definitely. I definitely have those days where you're just, you know, you're tired or you may not, you know, be feeling up to getting up or the weather's bad and you really don't want to go outside. Um, for me, I definitely get up and I have coffee. I absolutely love, love coffee and just the smell of it just kind of makes me really happy. And then second, um, I think the great the aspect of going to team training is that you know maybe if you're not feeling up to par you're gonna have somebody there with you and they can be there and kind of help you during training um 
and obviously the Adam as well. So that's kind of a positive perk. And I also put on my favorite music going to training and practice um, just to kind of, you know, lighten the mood for myself a little bit. Um, but it's just really nice having, you know, your teammates there and support you. And, you know, if you have a good friend on the team, you can tell them, hey, not feeling up to part today. And um, usually they kind of have your back in training. So that's always really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great, thanks. Thanks to both of you. Um, okay, so we have we have some questions from the attendees, so we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. Um, the first one, this is for Chelsea and, and Tatiana. Um, so they want you to talk through, um, so you, you both were part of, of USA Sweep, the 1500 and the 5000 in Rio. Um, Amanda's not on the call, but she was the other. Uh, Nick and Matt, um, McFadden, McClam, or McGrory. Um, so the question is, talk. can you talk through this? I guess pick one of them or both, I don't know. And then what was it like to sweep and favorite part of it? So whatever you want to talk about. So one of you two can go either, why don't you go first, Chelsea, and then Tatiana, you can, you can go second. Okay. Um, so just training leading up to the game. Um, it was, we were, we were getting pretty excited about um, us as a team and the fact that all three of us were in those races um, because we were hitting really fast times and really high speeds on the track. So we, we didn't really talk about it before we got there, but it was the day of the event and Adam called us over to like our team tent and he was like, he was like, Hey, I think we, I think you guys have a good chance of taking this race. I think you guys can sweep the podium on this one. And we we're just like, Oh yeah, like I think we can too. <laughs> and so um, we kind of talked through some strategies and they didn't always pan out. Um, a, B, and Z did not pan out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we had a bunch of different strategies. And, but we did take little parts of each of them and yeah. kind of made it work. Um, so um, I won't totally talk through the entire race. Um, it was like four years ago, so it's hard <laughs> to remember every lap. Um, but I do know that it was it was a bigger challenge. Um, it wasn't just one of us trying to do our best and get there. It was all three of us working together. So I think that was big triumph there was that we did it. And then we did it again a couple of days later. <laughs> yeah, I think it was, um, it was such a, a proud moment. Um, nothing I've ever experienced in my racing career. And so to do it with your teammates and for Team USA was actually a really, really incredible experience. And um, I was really, actually, it's been about nerves, really nervous about the game plan because there's so many moving parts in military racing and sometimes plans don't go to what was written. And so I remember for the 1500, um, you know, it was completely different both than what we've kind of drawn out. And a little bit in the five, we took a little game plan from from each of the into the drawings, but I think the one thing is that um, you know there were three of us, and that power um, really worked. And I think we were a really big threat to a lot of countries competing in three because some people were just you know competing as one person for for their country. And so I think it kind of made a really big statement and kind of made a lot of people nervous that we were really really strong and um, working together and really building that, that trust system um, and always looking at the, the moving parts in the race and trusting that person that, you know, what, what they're doing, you know, is for good and then reacting on that. So it was such an amazing experience. Um, something to always remember. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks to you both. I, I can say as a coach, it was, um, it was an exciting moment, and, and I was I was very proud of, of uh, watching each of you perform and play your part, um, because you're right as as a 
as a whole, you, you made um, each of you know you, you made one another stronger, and and um, and that was a, a really incredible incredible moment. Um, okay, next question. I'm going to try to find something we haven't talked about yet. Um, let's see. This one is. What do you okay? Here's a good good one. Interesting on the Paralympic Games. What do you wish you'd known before you got to the Paralympic Games? Is there any any lessons that for somebody who um, is going to just qualify the Paralympic Games? Something something you learned because we all have these really uh, we do have these great learning experiences in the first games that we go to. Um, so if there's one uh, thought that you could dis and, and and share. What would that be? Um, so uh, anyone have somebody like wave at me that wants to answer that question. All right, Susanna, she's ready to go. All right, Susan, then we'll have somebody else think about it too. We'll have at least two people answer that, but maybe more. If you have anyone else who wants to jump in, but we'll start with Susan. Okay. Um, well, the reason I kind of want to answer that is because when I went to London and Rio, I raced in the marathon. Um, and like, I love training. You know, I was, I love racing marathons, all of these things. But what I had not really prepared myself for mentally um, was that I wasn't going to race until the very last day. Um, and it seems like normal, yet I didn't really think about it at all. I knew when the race would be. But then when you get there, um, ordinarily you go early anyways. You want to acclimate, um, kind of get over the whole traveling, um, physical toll that takes. And then there's two weeks of competition. Um, and so I honestly, I was more prepared in Rio than I was in London. Um, but it's, if you're going and you're going, you know, you're going to race at the end only, it's sort of being able to, um, you know, celebrate the fact you're there and really um, make the most of that experience, but also remembering to focus on your event too. Like I needed to compete at the highest I could ever compete at on the very last day of the competition when I was living in a village, I was training for the marathon on the track. Um, and like psychologically just being okay with that and knowing my competition was doing the same thing. But um, that was something that really opened up my eyes ahead of time before London, or I mean, after London and before Rio is um, being just like prepared that you may not race to the very end and like people will have already finished and they'll be celebrating um they may already have left sometimes by the time you race um the, oh, the closing ceremonies might be the night after you race like the day you race um there's all kinds of things going on when you're at the end that um you kind of have to emotionally and like psychologically navigate and just focus on your event even though you're trying to make the most of that experience too so that was big for me honestly yeah, that that is a good one, Brian. Can you, Brian, will you share? Uh, give me a lesson on, on, on something people should know. One, there's a lot of food options. If um, <laughs> oh, no, no yeah, there is there's a lot of. Food. Um, so for me, I think although the Paralympics represent sort of the pinnacle of sports um, and that highest level of competition for for athletes to like want to get to. Um, I think what I wish I had known between my first games, which was in 2012 and then 2016, which was my second games, was that the Paralympics, that the Paralympic Games, it's like the title of it, but at the end of the day, um, you're racing on the track. You're, it's, it's a track meet. Um, it's, it's, you're racing against the same people that you've been, been racing against um, to qualify to get there. And so um, all of those sort of extra set of kind of nerves and like anxious feelings, um, it's easier, it was easier for me to sort of deal with those um, in 2016 because I, I learned to, I changed the way that I viewed the games because I, I ultimately started to think of it more of just like another track competition. And yeah, obviously if I won a medal, that would be really fantastic. Um, but at the end of the day to help me sort of uh, mentally prepare and everything, um, I wish I had known to just sort of view it as like a track meet and that I've done the training, I've done the preparation leading up to that point. Um, and then it just happens to be called the Paralympics um, is my, is how I view things. Yeah, that's a good, I think a good lesson. And, and I think that speaks to the way you, you matured and, and, and handle competitive anxiety 
and 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 that is to always maintain an appropriate frame of reference and, and contextualize uh, appropriately what 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 really it is that and and the opportunity that you have to to compete because it really is really is a privilege and an opportunity. Um, okay. So here's another question that we haven't addressed yet, and that is, uh, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna use it by saying I'll, I'll up it a little bit, but what's um, just a, what is the importance of scheduled days off for recovery days? Um, and I'm gonna give Aaron that that question because um, I, I can tell you as, as background, when Aaron first uh, uh, was a student athlete here. His idea of recovery was just 20 miles at 80% of race pace um, rather than 30 miles at race pace. Um, so I think one of the keys to his uh, improvement has been being able to rest and to take days off and, and to listen to his body. Um, so Aaron, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah. I just thought more put more work in more uh, results out were basically when I first got over there and um, I think that as soon as the season ended I think I would just we have a little bit of time off and I just took that as like oh we can this is me I get to just go do whatever go on the bike and do like 50 miles or something and just go and you know turn it into some massive volume week or something but yeah um, yeah I saw I think that's one of the keys to my success after coming here was um, learning to take the time off when it's scheduled um doing doing like nothing too and the time in between practices and stuff is making that something where you're you know even a race i would show like i would go to i remember one time i went to um the boulder boulder and i think i went kayaking the day before the race <laughs> and that didn't turn out so well another time i think i went and did some half marathon and i went in some like marines obstacle course and like was messed around so i i didn't realize how much those are extreme uh, examples, but you don't realize how much um, it takes out of you. Um, and then for a week to week basis, like those days off are huge. It sets you up for the entire week. Um, that rest day, we always rest on Sundays and it is critical to be able to perform throughout the week and be able to continue to get better um, without, without that time off. You're just in this constant fatigue state and you're never um, able to practice some of those really top end high end speed things are like those rolling 400s that Chelsea likes so much. If you come into a, those tired, you will not get anything out of them whatsoever. You're just going to be kind of puttering out the back. You'll be, you'll work hard. Like I always thought if I was working hard, then I'm, um, you know, eventually I'll just climb and you'll get better. Like, right. You put in a ton of work, you knock your body down and then you'll eventually rise up, but it doesn't, <laughs> it's a little bit more delicate process than that. Um, and yeah, I was definitely seeing a lot more success. And that goes too for um, days where the we're just a 10 mile at 70% or, uh, you know, just a jog day or something, the easy days as well. It's just as critical as those um, days where you have scheduled off days. Um, but yeah, I would, you're able to, I don't know. Yeah, I was able to see a ton of success in the last few years um, just from just from simply resting. <laughs> Yeah. Should be the easiest well, part. <laughs> yeah, it should be. So as a follow-up, uh, Jaden says, um, how do you force yourself to take a recovery day because it's mental, mentally challenging? And uh, Aaron, I mean, you, you, I, don't, I, I think that, um, well, you can speak to it, but I think ultimately if, if, if it's, are you, you, you train because of, of the enjoyment of the daily process, but you also understand that in order to, improve and reach your goals and, and to compete at your highest level on on race day that it's it's a part of the process and if you don't attend to it then you're going to undercut your performance on race day i can't right. answer it for you, more but you, you you can supplement that yeah and then i think even um competitions aside it's much more enjoyable week to week when you're um you're one you're seeing progression but two you're seeing um you're just able to do things you weren't able to do previously because uh, you're just tired. You didn't feel that tired. You woke up and you felt fine. But when you go and it's, that's the weird part is you, you can feel fine, but then you'll get in your chair and you're just not seeing the results that um, you want to see. And all of a sudden, instead of Daniel separating by 30 meters, all of a sudden he's only separating by like five meters. You feel a little better about that, but that's, and you're hitting higher speeds and you're like, you're, I don't know. It's just more fun 
I think that's the biggest thing. I just know like rest now and have more fun. You'll have more fun later instead of just sitting at this like kind of even feel um, 70 per year. Just, yeah, you're not right. ever um, reaching your potential. Just yeah. worth it. Yeah. Just and a I think, decision. I, yep. And I think, I think one of the, one of the um, uh, attitudes that you can take is that you, you, you don't have to be passive about your recovery days. You can attack those recovery days, even though you're limiting your, your energy expenditure. But I think that's, uh, I can speak as an athlete. That was how it turned the corner for me. Um, one was watching people around me who um, were, were better than me and they, they knew how to toggle on and off. So when it was time to go, they were ready, but when it was time to back off, they were, they were able to do that. And that's a key for being successful is being able to toggle on and off. Um, but as you're toggling off, you can still consider recovery as, 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 um, as you're, you're attacking that recovery day and, and doing everything you can that day to be ready for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday through Saturday, if that's your training week. Um, so, so it, ha it doesn't have to be passive. It can be, uh, uh, and, and there can be a, uh, an aggressive intention of, of, and that can go for nutrition. That can go for sleep. Uh, anything that goes on when you're not in that racing chair. Um, okay, well, we are at 1159, and I know we didn't get to all the questions, but I do think we at least touched on some of some shades of each of them that have been asked. Um, so I'd just like to take time to, to say thank you to each of our, our panelists and student athletes here um, who have joined us, and we, we appreciate your time, and, um, and also really appreciate all the attendees for tuning in both today and uh, the previous uh, part of the week. All these videos will be on our uh, uh, DREZ uh, University of Illinois website, uh, so links and all the PowerPoint presentations as well. And I think this is Facebook Live, so you can get this uh, replay on, on Facebook. So um, any follow-up questions that you have, you can feel free to email me at B-L-E-A-K-N-E-Y at Illinois.edu. So that's my last name at Illinois.edu. Um, and I'll do my best to answer those or forward it to somebody who can answer it for you. Um, so again, uh, thank you for, for tuning in and joining us and uh, have a great rest of, of 2020. And we'll look forward to getting back into competition in 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, thank you.